Um, so, no further ado, I'm going to over and to hand over to James uh, with Beyond Measure, Hidden History of Measurement. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for, so much for that introduction, Dave. It's wonderful Good. to be here. Thank you for coming out and having a listen. So yeah, the book is uh, Beyond Measure, Hidden History of Measurement, and it is the long span of measurement. It is thousands of years. We go back to ancient Babylonians, ancient Egyptians, you know, all the way through scientific revolution up to the sort of the new uh, redefinition of the, um, uh, the metric system in the last century or so. Oh, also, can everyone hear me okay? Am I yeah. 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 without a microphone? Great. Thanks. But, as Dave suggested, I wanted to start with something a little bit closer to home. So, <laughs> oh God, that's what we've gone through them. So, earlier this year, you may have noticed that there was a, uh, you know, a suggestion by the government that we're going to bring back imperial uh, measurements. And they've started this consultation and they're trying to get people's opinions on it. Um, and this sparked a lot of emotional reactions from people. So, here is um, Peter Hitchens writing the Daily Mail. Why were the metric zealots so hate-filled? I just want to read this out because I think it's uh, a fabulous example. All my life I've had to watch people rip up and tear down beautiful things in a strange search for a gleaming new utopia. Yet it's always ended in desolation, a vista of treeless wilderness and cracked concrete like a giant car park. <laughs> if you couldn't guess, he's talking about the metric system. <laughs> so, strong emotions on both sides. And what have we got on the other side? Complete nonsense, says the Asda boss on the uh, plans to bring back Imperial. It's bonkers, say traders. The man's a effing idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Well, that, let's leave that to your imagination. We can always trust the good people of Glasgow to give us the real, the real reaction, the real scoop. I love that. So <laughs> there were strong reactions on both sides, and a lot of people were surprised by this, or they were confused by this. Especially, you know, I think people my age who just came up with metric imperial doesn't really mean much to them. And they were thinking, why were there all these emotional reactions to a news like this? It wasn't just the idiocy of the, the proposal itself, but it was like what the measurements meant. But to me, it all made perfect sense, because I've spent the last couple of years writing a book on the history of measurement. And if I discovered one truth about the subject, one very simple but very expansive lesson, it's that measurement truly matters. It matters to governments, it matters to societies, and it matters to us as individuals. So in this talk, I want to explain why measurement matters. So to do that, we're going to have to go back to sort of some of the earliest records of civilization. We're going to go through the French Revolution, and we're going to go all the way up to Brexit. So we've got how long? <laughs> <laughs> Give it half an hour, I think, we should get through it in that time, right? Okay. So first question to answer, or first question to ask, is where do measurements come from? So. What we're looking at here is um, the Metrological Relief from the Ashmolean Museum, which is a sort of early example of uh, measurement standardisation. So the historian and author Robert Kreese says measurements need three qualities. They need to be accessible, they need to always be at hand, they need to be appropriate, they need to be of a useful size, so you can't measure mountains in matchsticks, and they need to be consistent, they need to be basically the same every time you use them. So, most ancient societies tended to turn to two sources for their first measurements. They looked at items found in nature, or they looked at the human body itself. So, this metrological relief, this is from ancient Greece, around 430 BC. You can probably guess, it is displaying a couple of different measurements. We've got the fathom, or the orgia, in ancient Greece, uh, the, the length of the outstretched arms. We've got an imprint of a foot right about here, and the foot turns up in every system of measurement going back to ancient times, because it's just, it's handy, isn't it? And we've got here, this is very hard to see, but this is supposed to be the imprint of a fist, and that's supposed to be, you know, like a measurement for a hand size. So pretty much all societies, from the Maya in Central America to the Maori of New Zealand, define units based on the human body. Some built particularly rich indexes from this single source. So the Maori, for example, have 12 units of measurement derived from the body. The smallest one is based on the smallest joint of the thumb, and the longest one is the length of the full body with the arms outstretched above like this. And we have a similar history ourselves in Europe. Uh, a lot of it has been lost to time, but there's lots of ancient measures, measures uh, like the Jepsen, which is one of my favourite. That's from uh, Middle English, and that's the amount that can be held in a pair of cupped hands. It, sort of, it just makes sense as a, as a unit of measurement. You know, you're measuring out ingredients, you're measuring out something at the market, why not put it in your cupped hands? 
Where things get interesting, uh, particularly in measuring distance, is when you have lengths that are much greater than the human body. People get inventive here. So you have ancient units like the axe throw or the bow shot. Uh, in the Nicobar Islands in the Indian Ocean, they used to calculate the distance of journeys based on the number of coconuts you would need to drink. So you might be going, you might be going down the shops, that's a two coconut journey. You might be going the next island over, that's a 20 coconut journey. You need to keep that in mind. In, in Finland, there's um, one called the Peninkulma, which is about four and a half miles or seven and a half kilometers. And that's the distance a dog's bark can be heard. Uh, the Sami of Northern Europe have one called the Poron Kusima, and um, am I allowed to swear very lightly? Is that, yes. that going to be okay? Yeah. 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 So Poron Kusima roughly translates as reindeer's piss. And <laughs> it's the distance a reindeer will walk before they need to urinate. So these sound bizarre, but they actually fit our earlier criteria that Robert Kreese outlined. So let's take the Poron Kusima as an example. It's certainly accessible because there's reindeer everywhere you look. It's appropriate because you're often going on journey with the reindeer. You're taking them with you. They're maybe beast of burden. And they say it's consistent. And I will leave that up to the Sami to make sure that they measured that correctly. I don't know whether that is true or not, but I hope so. So we've got our units of measurement. Now, why? Why do we need these at all? So I'm going to start with a little quote from a, a historian of science called Theodore Porter. He's talking about quantification in general, so this is any type of numbering, but measurement is a big part of this. So he says, quantification is a technology of distance. Reliance on numbers and quantitative manipulation minimizes the need for intimate knowledge and personal trust. Quantification is well suited for communication that goes beyond the boundaries of locality and community. So what Porter is saying here, I think, uh, is that measurement is essentially a type of language. It's how you communicate. If you're going down to the market, you need to be able to talk to the traders there in units that you and they understand. If you're sending out plans to some far corner of your empire to build a new temple, you need to make sure that the people who get those plans can translate what they've been told into a building. And if you're collecting taxes, which is a big part of the history of measurement, you need to have consistent units to collect them in. So all this makes it really, really important for early states and civilizations to not only define, but to maintain units of measurements. So even in our earliest legal text, the, the earliest surviving one we have, the Code of Hammurabi, for around 1750 BC in ancient Babylon, there are prescriptions about not cheating with measurement, and there are definitions of what the right measure should be. So here is uh, the Louvre Stele, which is where we get the Code of Hammurabi from. And here is, if we look a, bit, a little bit closer, we have the relief on the top here. So there's two figures. The standing one here is Hammurabi, and the seated one is Shamash, who was the sort of solar deity, but also the god of justice. So it's appropriate that he would be on top of the code of laws like this. A little difficult to see, but if you look, Shamash is handing two items over to Hammurabi. There's a measuring rod, there's a rod here in the middle, <laughs> I've given it away now, and there's a coil of rope here. And most archaeologists think that these are measuring instruments. They are how Hammurabi would have dictated the law of the land, essentially. So, this is where we get this clear link between measurement and power, measurement and sovereignty. There's a reason why a ruler is both a length of material with incremental markings and an individual who controls society, who wields the power of life and death over other humans. Because to rule is to rule. This is something that's not just true of ancient societies, but it goes right through the Middle Ages, the early modern period, and into modern times, as we'll see in all sorts of legal texts and constitutions that are used to sort of set up the rules of the state, people pay attention to measurement. So just another quick, quick example here. We've got the Magna Carta here. In Clause 35 of the Magna Carta, there is to be but one measure of wine throughout the kingdom, and one measure of ale also, and one measure of corn, and one breadth of dyed russet and habergé cloth, and let weights be dealt with as with measures. So this is not trivial stuff. This is the sort of thing that, you know, in the case of the barons and King John, that you would revolt over, that you wanted to get settled because it helps the society run. For me, though, the connection between measurement and the state, and measurement and power, what it means to us, really hit home when I went to Cairo, when I was researching part of my book. I went there to see something called a nylometer. Now, can anyone guess what a nylometer measures? <laughs> it's the River Nile, it's the River Nile. So, a little bit of background here. 
It's hard to overstate the importance of the Nile in ancient Egypt. It's why the Egyptian civilization exists at all, because the Nile floods in a predictable annual cycle, and in doing so delivers a huge amount of mineral wealth onto the surrounding plains, creating this fabulous sticky and silty soil that everything grows in. As a result, the Egyptian calendar is split into three seasons, Akhet, Peret, and Shemu, which mean flooding, growth, and drought. So the flooding of the Nile was so important that it was actually deified uh, as the god of happy. He was known as the lord of the fish and the birds of the marshes. He's an androgynous god. We see him here in back to back in two little relief carvings. So he's depicted as a man, but he has swollen breasts, which are supposed to signify the abundance that he brought to the world. If you also look here, he's wearing a very nice little crown of reeds there and papyrus shoes. So, measurement was vital to capturing the richness of the Nile on multiple levels. First, you had to measure out the fields themselves, and this was particularly important for the Nile because each time it flooded, it destroyed all the previous field boundaries. So there was actually a specialised class of Egyptian civil servant known as the Harpendotai. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to say that again. Harpendonotai, who were the rope stretchers, because that was the, what they used to redo the boundaries of the fields. Then, obviously, you have measurement when it came to collecting the grain from the fields, from weighing it and divvying it up into taxes and putting it away into the granaries. And then you have the nilometers. So the nilometers are essentially huge measuring sticks. They were carved into the banks of the Niles, or sometimes they were sort of carved as freestanding pillars in wells, which would fill up with water. And why was this important? Well, because once you knew the depth of the flood, you could predict what the harvest would be. So you knew whether or not, you, if you had a bad harvest coming, you might need to put a little bit more grain away in the granaries in case there was a rebellion because there was famine in the land. If there was a good harvest coming, you knew you could carry on building that lovely little bijou pyramid that you're going to retire to later <laughs> down in Memphis. So I, I went to see one of these nilometers um, uh, on the island of Rhoda, which is an island right in the middle of the Nile. This is what it looks like from the outside. This is a sort of um, 11th century Ottoman structure that was built around it. And this is what it looks like inside. It's hard to see some of the detail here, but it was this fabulously ornate structure. Uh, and this lady here is um, Salima Ikram, who, was, uh, who is the professor of um, Egyptology at the American University of Cairo, who is showing me around for this. Uh, this is what it looks like from the inside. So this central pillar here, that is the nilometer itself. And that is carved with cubits. And to read it, the water would fill up from the bottom of this well, and you would have to go down these steps on the side, it's very, very tall, about, about three stories high, four stories high, go down these steps in order to take the reading. And there is me uh, grinning like an idiot at the, at the big column there. Um, so <laughs> here's the twist, though. A lot of these nilometers were actually built into temple complexes. So why? Well, first, because the ancient Egyptian priesthood was really more like a proto-civil service. It was the priests who made the day-to-day -day decisions about the running of the kingdoms and translated the pharaoh's orders into actual policy. But also because measuring the Nile was not just a bureaucratic operation. Because the Nile itself was a deity, and because the flooding represented the favor of that deity, you weren't just measuring the depth of the flood, you were measuring how happy the gods were with you. So if the measurement was low, not only would you need to prepare for the next famine, you'd need to chuck a few more sacrifices into the river as well to make sure it topped up again for the next year. <laughs> so this, I think, is, uh, why, is a fantastic symbol of what measurement means in early civilizations. Mm -hmm. It's not just something practical that helps run the state. It's something that is sort of a way of controlling reality, mm -hmm. a way of predicting the future. Uh, and that's something that we see right through uh, the sort of embrace of measurement during the scientific revolution as well. So hopefully I've now established that measurement is important for people, for society, and for the state in general. Standardizing units of measurement helps nat nations prosper, and control over measurement is both a symbol and a tool of power. So I'm going to leap forward a few thousand years from the ancient Egyptians to 1789 to the, to the French Revolution, where the world's most important system of measurement was created, the metric system. <coughs> Welcome to the metric revolution. <coughs> so, when Napoleon Bonaparte, who was then, um, there he is, the first council of the French Republic, unveiled the metric system in 1799, he said this, conquests will come and go, but this work will endure. 
He was right. <laughs> the empire that Napoleon claimed in the following decades collapsed back in itself, back in on itself, around halfway through the century. <laughs> but the territory of the metric system only grew over this same period. From its unveiling in 1799, the metric system now spans the entire globe, more or less. A few caveats, and we'll get to those later. But where did the metric system come from, and why was it created? So here we have some measuring uh, tools from uh, some capacity, me capacity measures from uh, pre-revolution France. So before the French Revolution, France was not in great shape for a number of reasons. I'm not going to pretend that issues with measurement were the biggest challenge facing the country, but they were surprisingly high up on the list. The problem was that France had too many units of measurement. Journeying through the country in 1789, the English travel writer Arthur Young described the tormenting variations of the country's <laughs> units. He said that the infinite perplexity of measures exceeds all comprehension. They differ not only in every province, but in every district and almost in every town. The denominations of the French measures, as the readers will see, are almost infinite. So the capacity unit known as the pont, the pint, uh, that was actually <coughs> shown on the far right there, measured 0.9 litres in Paris, 1.9 litres in saint and montant and 3.3 litres in Côte d'Or. The most common measure of cloth, the en, ranged in size from 300 to 600 lignes. And how long was a lignes? Well, it depends. <laughs> By one estimate, Ancien Régime France had around 1,000 named units in common use and around 250,000 local variants. So Arthur Young, infinite perplexity, he was, he was spot on. This lack of standardisation was not just an annoyance, it hurt people's lives in very real and tangible ways. Part of the problem was that local lords often retained the right to define units of measurement, because, as I said earlier, to rule is to rule. This meant that they could change units as they saw fit, so they'd often cheat their subjects. They would, when they came to collect their taxes, which were usually delivered in grain, they would bring out a special bushel, and this bushel was just a little bit larger than the one the peasants used down in the market. Mm -hmm. and if you say to them, well, that's not fair, Why you can't do that, they go, ah, it's my right to define the units of measurement. They are what I say they are, so I'm going to take a little bit extra off the side. So, this caused troubles. This meant in the run-up to the revolution, when the third estate, that is, the, the common people, were collecting their grievances in a series of documents known as the Cahier, Cahier de Doléances, and I do apologise for my French accent, um, this is the Cahier de Doléances here, it means literally notebook of complaints. The demand for metrological reform was actually very high on the agenda. In fact, in the Cahier de Doléances, there are more complaints about measurement than there are about the courts, or about the infringements of personal liberties. And there was a popular slogan that was repeated by the people at this point, which was, they demanded one king, one law, one weight, and one measure. So they hadn't got round to getting rid of the king yet, but that was, uh, was going to come later. <laughs> but this was the important bit. Like in the Magna Carta, they wanted standardisation. They wanted fairness. If the revolution was going to deliver equality before the law, that also meant equality in measurement. So, how did they solve this? Well, the revolutionaries decided to come up with an entirely new system of measurement, the metric system. It was to have several important attributes. First, all the units would be interconnected. The capacity measure was constructed as a cube based on the unit of length. And then when you filled the capacity measure with water, the weight of that water would be the unit of weight. Secondly, this new system was going to be decimal, with all units divisible by 10. This was a tough proposition at the time, still is for some people as most units of measurement were base 12 or base 16, and the advantage of that is that they easily divide into halves, thirds, and quarters, which is very useful if you're you know, buying things down at the market, but it was less useful for, say, scientists, for economists, for government people, who were working with very large and very small numbers. Because the metric system, sorry, the decimal system is very useful for that, because to move between magnitudes, you just move the decimal place amount. Thirdly, they said that we're going to come up with completely new names and prefixes for the units in the metric system, mostly derived from Greek and Latin. And these include terms that we're still familiar with today, like kilo for a thousand and cent for a hundredth part, but also terms that never caught on, quite beautiful, like myria for 10,000. So uh, a, myria, a myria meter would have been 10 kilometres back in the day. The big problem, though, was calculating the unit of length, the metre. This was not only the linchpin of the entire system, 
the uh, unit from which the others would be derived, but it also became the symbol of the metric system's political intent. The metric system was intended to encapsulate and strengthen the Enlightenment ideals that had spurred the revolution forward. It was supposed to be rational, scientific, universal, accessible to all mankind, just like the slogan, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. So, how do they, how do they get around this? Eventually, the scientists decided that they would use the meridian to define the meter. So they would define it as one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator, based on the meridian, which is the you know, imaginary lines going from the north to the south pole, but based on the meridian that runs through Paris. And obviously, we have a different meridian in the UK. We're more used to the Greenwich meridian uh, for establishing mean time. But the Paris meridian was for a long time a sort of uh, a great rival to this in the scientific world. So it took a pair of astronomers, two men named Jean-Baptiste Delambre and Pierre Nachon, seven years to take the necessary measurements. And they traveled all the way through revolutionary France using trigonometry to map the landscape. Because what they'd worked out at the time was that the Earth was not a perfect sphere, and neither was it really a perfect, um, uh, what's the term, oblate? Oblate? Oh, right, <laughs> thank you. It, um, it was sort of rucked and bumpy. So they needed to take precise measurements going all the way through France, down into Spain, uh, from Dunkirk to Barcelona, in order to calculate what this meridian would be. So satellite imagery has actually revealed that they were short in their calculations. <laughs> the meter has never been one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. It has always been 0.2 millimeters short. Now that is a tiny difference, about the thickness of a couple of sheets of paper, but it's an error all the same. Still, they did the work and they came up with the meter. So this is what they look like. This is um, the meter and kilogram of the archives as they're known. This is in the French National Archives in Paris. Uh, and these are kept in a locked, tri a triple locked cabinet right in the center with an alphanumeric code on the door that was set in 1789 and hasn't been changed since. So, you know, not great security standards, but fine. I was able to go in and have a look, basically. So, does the error in the meter's size matter? No, not in the slightest. What matters is the story that the French were able to tell about the metric system how its creation had involved years of painstaking labor and calculation, and how it signaled a new political power in the land and in the continent. To sort of encapsulate this, consider that in Ancien Régime France, the main unit of length used in everyday uh, calculations was called the pied du roi, literally the foot of the king. So this was a unit of length derived, so the story went, from the king's foot. Now, instead of deriving authority from the body of the monarch, the Republicans, the revolutionaries, could say that their measurements were instead based on a mankind's shared heritage, on the earth itself. So, one of the people, oops, one of the people involved with this uh, work was uh, Laplace, uh, a famous astronomer and uh, a mathematician. And when he was uh, involved in unveiling the meter as well, he said that after 1799, French farmers could boast that the field that nourishes my children is a known portion of the globe, and so, in proportion, am I a co-owner of the world. Mm -hmm. Which is a very lovely sentiment, mm -hmm. and sort of bollocks, but basically <laughs> true as well. <laughs> it didn't turn out that way, but it's a nice thing to say, Laplace, and I'm glad you said it. <laughs> so, Laplace's quote highlights the political intent behind the metric system. But I think it's also important to put this in wider context as well. When we think about weights and measures, we don't think about them as defining society. But the French Revolution, the creation of the metric system, shows that they really did. So in addition to the metric system, the revolutionaries also introduced a Republican calendar. Here, they replaced the Gregorian calendar, as we know it, all the months we know, with their own set of months. Each month had 30 days. And each month, was, each month was divided into three weeks of ten days each. And they gave them all names that were supposed to uh, you know, represent um, the, uh, the, the virtues of the uh, revolution. I'm sorry, I'm trying to click this, but uh, it doesn't seem to want to go. Uh, the computer, maybe? Yeah, I'm not sure where the uh, receipt... Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So here are some of the names that they came up with. So they don't quite map onto the... Gregorian calendar, and they overlap months, but we have December to January is Nivos, the month of snow, 
Uh, January to February is pluvios, the month of rain. February to March is ventos, the month of wind. And the idea was that by getting rid of the uh, Gregorian calendar, which was full of saints' days, which was full of Catholic celebrations, that they would get rid of the influence of the church on everyday society. So instead of a seven-day week that pivots on a church-going Sunday, you would have a 10-day week that ended with a sort of Republican celebration, Republican and atheist virtues instead. Uh, not everyone took this too seriously, uh, of course. So there was a, an English writer at the, at, at the same time who came up with his own version of it. So <laughs> <laughs> September to October is wheezy, October to November sneezy, freezy. Then he has slippy, drippy and nippy for December to March, showery, flowery and bowery for March to June, and June to September is hoppy, croppy and poppy. Yeah. Brilliant. That's pretty, pretty, I thought, I think that's pretty good. I think that was in, that was in Punch magazine, something, some equivalent to that. Anyway, so not, ev not everyone was taking this as seriously as the French. But they did, the French went even further than the calendar. They even decimalised time itself. They replaced the 24-hour day with a 10-hour day. So here is an example clock from the revolution, as you can see. 10 at the top, 5 at the bottom. 10 hours instead of 24. So 7 a.m. in the 24-hour clock is about a few minutes before 3 in decimal. Uh, noon, of course, is halfway through the day, so it's 5 instead of 12. And what time are we now? We're, eight, we're at 8 o'clock, so that would be about 8.33 in decimal. The interesting thing, of course, is that the decimal clock has 10 hours in a day, 100 minutes in an hour, and 1,000 minutes in a day. Uh, 1,000 minutes, sorry, that's a typo there. Yeah, 1,000 minutes in a day, which means there are 100,000 seconds in a day compared to the 86,400 we have currently. That means that one regular second uh, would be 0. Point, oh, I've got that the wrong way around, sorry. <laughs> uh, the regular second is 0. 0.864 of a decimal second. So a decimal second is slightly faster than a regular second which I think is very appropriate for the fast-paced revolution. Now you're probably thinking, how the hell did people keep track of all this? <laughs> that they really changed their calendars and their clocks and start living by this system? And the short answer is no, they didn't. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Decimal time lasted for a few years. The calendar did a bit better, but petered out after a decade. But the metric system kept going. Well, there's a caveat to that as well. When Napoleon came into power, he got rid of the metric system because he thought it was confusing for everyone. Uh, and then when he was deposed and they had the July Revolution in 1832, uh, they brought it back, which makes France not only the first country to adopt the metric system, but the first country to reject it, which I think is very wonderfully French. Good on. <laughs> so Napoleon, when he was exiled and writing his memoirs about all this, he complained that the new yeah there he is looking very grumpy there is the new system of weights and measures will be a stumbling block and a source of difficulty for several generations. It's just tormenting the people with trivia. Mm. So this brings us into a brief history of anti-metric sentiment. Uh, so as that quote from Napoleon illustrates, as long as the metric system has existed, people have been unhappy about it. But the fact is, it works fabulously well. As Napoleon conquered Europe, he introduced the metric system as part of the set of legal reforms that he had, the, Mo the Napoleonic Code. As you might expect, some countries hated this and they rejected it, and others embraced it, usually for the same reason that France had, France had invented the metric system in the first place, because their own units of measurement were a mess. It was good to have a clean slate, and it was especially good for someone else to take the political flack of imposing it. There were two major countries at this time, from the sort of 19th century through onwards, that rejected metric. That's the US and the UK. <laughs> there, were, there were lots of reasons for this. Uh, the main ones being that the US and the UK were simply so rich and powerful at this point that they really didn't need to switch. Obviously, the UK first was most powerful and the US later. They both invested a lot of money in machinery and in factories that all tended to work in Imperial, and they had huge internal markets, which mean, meant that one of the main uh, benefits of the metric system, that it removes friction in trade, wasn't, didn't really apply to them. The US obviously had the continental US itself, and the UK had the, the British Empire at the time. But there was also a lot of cultural resistance that helped to anchor these arguments. So in the 19th century, for example, you see groups appearing like the International Institute for Preserving and Perfecting Weights and Measures, 
which is an American organization that gave speeches, wrote pamphlets, and lobbied politicians not to adopt the metric system. I was doing some digging in the archives uh, for them, and I found God, uh, their theme song, which is called The Pints, The Pound, The World Around, which they presumably sung at their meetings. So I just want to illustrate, I, I've tried playing this on the piano, and uh, it's not much of a tune. I'll get, I don't want to say anything against it, but it's, it's, not, it's not a great one. But I'm going to look at one of the verses here, because I think it gives you a flavour of it. This is one of the verses. Sing along if you want. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> then down with every metric scheme taught by the foreign school, we'll worship still our father's God and keep our father's rule. A perfect inch, a perfect pint, the Anglo's honest pound, shall hold their place upon the earth till time's last trump shall sound. <laughs> so obviously there's a lot of jingoism, there's a lot of xenophobia here, we've got the foreign school, we've got the, the Anglo, is a sort of suspicious racial category about, you know, implied superiority. There's actually some nastier bits than that in some of this, but <laughs> that's what we'll put up on screen for now. Um, so there's also a very interesting, to me I think, religious strain to this, and this is something that you don't often think about when you think about measurement. The reference to our father's rule. So this is because the metric system was not only associated with the atheism of the French Revolution, because there, but because there was a popular belief at the time, semi-popular, that imperial units and the inch in particular were in fact imparted by God, that they were God's chosen measurement and he had intended for the Anglo-Saxon Saxon race to use them. So where does this come from? This is a little bit of interesting history. This comes from pyramidology. So pyramidology is a sort of uh, loose name for a mess of conspiracy theories about the Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, but it actually has its roots in met metrology and in measurement. So basically, adherents believed that the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza encoded hidden truths about the world, including when it was going to end. And from these dimensions, they went over there they took all sorts of measurements, as you can see, they made these very complicated diagrams, and they discovered, in quotation marks, the pyramid inch was encoded within these stones, which was just a shade longer than the imperial inch. They argued, they, well, they thought that God had imparted the design of the pyramids onto the Egyptians, and got them to build it in order to create a lasting monument for holy measurement. So they called this our monument in the desert, our inheritance in the desert that we were supposed to cherish and keep for all time. They argued that if we abandoned the imperial system, we were abandoning not only our sacred history, but our devotion to God. Mm. Now, you may think that in this day and age, we've sort of moved past that sort of thinking, but that's not entirely true. So, as a part of my research for my book, as Dave mentioned earlier, I hung out with this man, Tony Bennett. So, he is a member of a group known as ARM, Active Resistance to Metrication. This is a sort of guerrilla group of men and women who tour the country and they replace signposts that use metric markers with imperial ones. <laughs> they tear them down in the dead of night and hide them in the hedgerows, they paint over them and they create stickers to go plaster them. And it's arguably quite odd. Behaviour? Well, yeah, Behaviour I'm fond of, I should say. I, I like this sort of eccentricity a great deal. So obviously I had to go on one of their raids with them. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Tony, we had a good time. We went down to Thaxted. Lovely, lovely town. Home of Holst. He was where he wrote the Jupiter Symphony. You know, very sort of heart of Englishness. Certain sort of Englishness anyway. And uh, while we were there, we scoped out some of these signposts, which as you can see are in metric. They're 300 metres, 250 metres. So we went down there, we took our measurements, and... Tony ooh, helped me replace them. So here he is getting his kit out of the car. Uh, very essential, he told me, was the high-vis jacket. He says, no one questions what you're doing if you're wearing a high-vis jacket. <laughs> <laughs> he, absolutely right. He was yeah. spot on about that. So we, we went down there. We had a couple of pints. We looked at the sign. <laughs> It was a, I had a great time, it was a great old day. And he uh, put together these stickers and then he went and replaced all the, all the units. So instead of meters, it now says yards. And all, I, ha I haven't been back to check if they're still up there at this point in time. 
Um, I was a, I was a nervous wreck for this because I'm I'm a, I'm a law abiding fella, and <laughs> the idea of even doing minimum amounts of vandalism uh, really chilled me to the core. But for Tony, old hand didn't didn't you know absolutely picture of calm, didn't sweat about it. He says he's done this thousands of times up and down the country. And I believe him. So. <laughs> Me and Tony, obviously, we talked about all of this, and I talked to him a lot about what his motivations were, and he told me a lot of things about preserving the heritage of the country, uh, and a lot of stuff I agree with. I, I don't think that imperial units should be forgotten, and I quite like our hybrid system. You know, no one wants to get rid of pints in pubs. Uh, miles and yards, I'm not too familiar with them, but a lot of people are, and they make sense. That's fine by me. Um, oh, I should also be clear, from a legal perspective, Arm is actually in the right. So the, the, the law when it comes to what units should be used on signposts is a bit of a hodgepodge. But for small distances like this, they should indeed be an imperial. The reason they're in metric is because the council will say, look, we've got to build a signpost that's going to last for hopefully 60, 80 years. We're not going to put it in something that we need to replace when we go fully metric. So they say, we'll just make it metric. No one will notice the difference. Tony notices the difference. He's out there, he's looking for these things. But the more I chatted to Tony, the more I found that he had other motivations as well. He is an evangelical Christian, and he, he, his, belief was, his belief is that um, God had separated the world into separate nations. And the, the reason he, he illustrated this by talking about the story of the Tower of Babel, which was, you know, in his mind, uh, sort of the first example of the nations of humanity trying to come together and to build a common nation, a common language. And of course, God didn't like that, and he said, get rid of this, you're all going to have separate languages, separate nations. So his belief was that by preserving the imperial units in the UK, he was following divine rule, in, 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 a, in a word. So he saw the European project, the EU specifically, as something that he wanted to get rid of. So this is a quote from Tony. When I came to look closely at it, the more it appeared to me that the European project was a deliberate attempt to reverse what happened at Babel, to say that the idea of the nation state is redundant. Now, what we need to build is a strong international organisation, perhaps even a one world government. So, the idea that measurement could be divine is not just something that we left behind with the ancient Egyptians, it's something that people still think about today. So, we're going back to the nylometer here. And this is, this is what I want to say about measurement today. That we think of it as something that is dry, that is arbitrary, that we only for pedants or something like that. But measurement is deeply entwined with the history of nations, deeply entwined with the birth of civilization itself. It's how we build civilization. It's how we make sense of the world around us. And that's why people were so emotional, I think, about the return of imperial measures. It's also why I think measurement matters. Thank you. <laughs>